Hi, my name is Gabriel Kenrack. I'm eight years old and I'm a third grader at the Feynman School in Rockville, Maryland. I'm gonna to talk to you today about repetitive patterns in the juggler sequence. I'd like to start with a short introduction to the juggler sequence for anyone who hasn't heard it before. <coughs> a juggler sequence is an integer sequence, like the better known coat sequence, so that where you start with an integer greater than zero, and to get the next term, you either raise the square root if it's an even number, or take the square root and cube the result if it's an odd number. Then you use the floor function to get it back to an integer. To make the full sequence, repeat this process until it hopefully converges to one. We've computed this, all the sequences up to one million, and they all converge to one, but there's no proof for all starting positive integers. It's also interesting to look at the longest sequences and the highest numbers in each sequence. Using Mathematica, I made a graph plot of the first 24 juggler sequences. The vertices are color coded, so the higher numbers are lighter than lower numbers. Brown edges are from juggling odd numbers, and blue edges are from juggling even numbers. Notice that all of the edges near two are blue. It seems that small odd numbers have relatively long change, and in fact, you have to go three steps away from two, excluding one, before you get to a brown edge. You can also see that there's lots of numbers going into six compared to four and eight, and there's a lot more branches on the six side. We'll talk more about this in a minute. What we're trying to prove is, for all x, there's a finite number k, such that if you compose the juggler function, k times the value of that composition would be equal to one. I hope you can use repetitive subsequences to make that general proof. It helps that every time a number appears in a sequence, the rest of the sequence finishes in the same way. I'm interested in subsequences that show up in a lot of juggler sequences. For example, the sequence 113661 and shows up in almost half the juggler sequences up to one million. This is a plot of the fraction of sequences a given number appears in as a function of the total number of sequences you compute. Notice that the shape of the line for 11, 6, and 5 are almost the same, but not identical, which we expect because 5 goes to 11, and 11 goes to 36 and then to 6. 4 and 6 need to trade because when 6 goes down, 4 goes up, and vice versa. Not exactly because you have to take 8 into account, which kind of squiggles out on its own. If we look at the inverse of the juggler function, the only way to get to one is through two, and the only way to get to two is through four, six, or eight. Four, six, and eight have five, seven, and nine predecessors respectively. Because of this, we expect that the ratio of subsequences that go through four, six, or eight would be five to seven to nine. However, at least in the first million sequences, this isn't the case. Six shows up in 60%, while four and eight are only in 25 and 15% respectively. We don't yet know why this is. Also using the inverse function, we can see that if there are any lower sequences which don't converge, there will be an infinite number, because every number in the sequence will have many predecessors. The big strategy for finding a proof is to try and figure out the properties of a number whose juggler sequence doesn't converge. There are 
two scenarios where that would happen. Either a Delaware sequence that diverges or a sequence that loops. There are no trivial loops, um, which means that any loop would have to be very complicated. Um, I have a proof that there can't be a trivial loop in the handout, which is in the gift exchange. If we can show that there's a number whose sequence doesn't converge can't exist, then we've got a general proof. 30 seconds. That's all about all I can fit in five minutes, but I have some more work that I've done which, on this, which is also in the handout. I really want to thank Wolfram Research for giving me access to Mathematica so I could work on this, and also Bill Gosper for helping me figure out how to use Mathematica to make all my plots. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Gabriel.